करुणाम करुणा तरंगताक्षी धृत पाशांगुश पुष्पाणचापिरावृता मयूख अहम विभावये भवानी नमस्ते वेल वी हैव अ लॉट टू कवर इन दिस एपिसोड सो लेट्स जंप राइट इन नाम वन ट्वेंटी भक्तिवश्या शी इज अट्रैक्टेड एंड कंट्रोल्ड बाय डिवोशन Vashya means attraction or keeping under control. Shivananda Lahari is in praise of Shiva and Saundarya Lahari is in praise of Lalitambika. Both have 100 shlokas and are composed by Adi Shankaracharya. Shivananda Lahari 62 refers to the divine mother as Bhakti Janani. meaning mother thy name is devotion and bhaktar bakam rakshati she nurses the devotee as her child when one is overwhelmed with the feeling of devotion tears roll down from his eyes his voice gets choked and goosebumps appear this could be followed by shuddering of the body Well, it's always nice to talk about ecstatic symptoms. I went through a long period in the late 70s and 1980s where I was getting them regularly. Tears, faltering of the voice, goosebumps, uh speaking like a madman, shouting, running here and there, dancing. Uh great excitement and also great uh great lamentation all these symptoms and many many more are present in the bodies of advanced devotees so when we see someone in these states then we should help them by reminding them of their ishta devata and we we know who that is <laughs> that will all also just increase their devotion and their ecstasy so she is the protector of one who is in devotion to her she gives freedom from fear abhaya abhaya was the given name of my adi guru fearless and he was too he did some really amazing things because he just didn't fear for himself he was completely devoted and because of that he was able to conquer fear so this should be our mood that i am fearless because i am protected by the universal mother and she is the author of all karmic results huh she can also clear away like mother kali bhadra kali is very much noted for being able to clear away one's accumulated karma especially from future births and that means that one is eligible for liberation so you see these are the benedictions that she gives to her surrendered devotees Nama 116 Badra Murtihi Tirumalar the great Tamil saint says those who are ignorant say that Shiva and love are different those who are knowledgeable say that both Shiva and love are the same Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa says Those who are the masters in Vedas and Shastras say this is right and that is wrong. But even assuming there are defects in the ways of worship by such devotees, 
God will never mind the defects as he wants only sincere devotion. He is ready to bless us, but we are not ready to get his blessings. This is because the path followed by us is wrong. Some people say that they don't want liberation. Huh? They don't want moksha. They want to live forever in some heavenly realm where they can do devotional service to their Ishtadevata. But this is actually not the aim of the Vedas. The aim of the Vedas is nothing but moksha, liberation, complete freedom from samsara. See, and this is what happens to the devotee who really doesn't care whether he gets liberation or not. <laughs> He just wants to be in association with his Ishta Devata by one way or another. He doesn't discriminate. For example, if he is chanting the holy name, he considers that sufficient. Then there's no need for elaborate rituals or huge offerings or great projects of service and so on. Simply that chanting alone is enough because the holy name is non-different from the deity. Whether you worship a male or female deity doesn't make any difference. Those who worship the Divine Mother, though, have an advantage, which is that she is all manifestation. So from the very beginning, as soon as one realizes this, he knows that I and the Goddess are one. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 9.30, Even if the vilest sinner worships me with exclusive devotion, he should be accounted as a saint. He is positive in his belief that there is nothing like devoted worship of God. Krishna proceeds to say in the next shloka, my devotee never perishes. Krishna also says in 1154, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am. All the scriptures and shrutis make a clear definition of devotion. Devotion can be defined as when feelings of ardent love aimed at a transcendent object blossom within the subject expecting nothing in return, crossing the boundaries and limitations of all the prescribed rituals, where there is a desire to stay with that object forever. There's a saying in India, the greater the sinner, the greater <laughs> the, greater the saint. <laughs> what a wonderful idea, huh? And the example is Valmiki. Valmiki was a terrible hunter. Uh, he used to like to shoot the birds and animals, not fatally, but just mortally wound them and then watch them struggling and flapping around on the ground. And <laughs> that was his fun. So what kind of a guy was Valmiki? Anyway, one day Narada Muni was coming by that place in the forest. And he saw Valmiki and of course immediately knew everything about him. And he said to Valmiki, what are you doing? Why are you harming and giving pain to these innocent animals? Don't you know that when you leave this body, their spirits will come and attack you and rip you to shreds? And he gave Valmiki a vision. He showed her. <laughs> He showed that when he is leaving the body, all the animals are coming and tearing him apart. And Valmiki was very much afraid. He said, oh, Bhagwan, what can I do uh, to avoid this terrible fate? And so uh, Narada said, you can chant the name of God, Rama. And Valmiki said, oh no, I'm too much of a sinner. I can't chant the name of God. So then Narada Muni said, well, 
How about you chant the name of death, Mara? Velmiki said, oh yes, I'm very familiar with death. I can chant that. So <laughs> then Narada Muni left and he was sitting there in the woods chanting, Mara, 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 Mara. <laughs> See, this is called Nam Abhas. It's a very secret thing that if anyone chants one of the holy names, even accidentally, even without understanding the meaning, then the action of the name will occur uh, without any difficulty, without any obstacle. There's another story that one Muslim hunter, again, another very sinful character, was uh, attacked by a tiger. And as he lay dying and the tiger is ripping out his entrails, you know, the way they do, he was going, in, in Persian, haram, haram, which means, oh, how terrible. It's a lamentation. But because they contain the holy name of Ram, just because of that, he got liberation. Another story is that one very sinful man was dying and he had no place to stay. He was homeless. You know, he had no shelter. So unknowingly, he crawled beneath a Tulasi tree. And because he died on that spot, he got liberation. These all wonderful stories show the protection given by God to even accidental, <laughs> accidental, fortuitous devotees who do a little bit of service. God accepts the service, even a little bit of service, as a great deal and gives liberation to even the lowest of the devotees. Nama 121, Bhayapaha. She dispels fear. Taitriya Upanishad 2.9 says, having known Brahman, he is not afraid of anything as there is none by his side. He is with Brahman who is always only a witness Therefore, the Upanishad says that there is none with him. Brihadaranyaka Upanishad 142 says, If there is nothing else except me, where is the question of fear? The root cause of fear is the existence of the other, a second person. The existence of the other is felt only out of ignorance, in fact, there is no second within this universe. Everything is only the same supreme self within who prevails in everybody. When it is mistaken for the second, this happens because of Maya. So out of Maya, one is thinking, oh, there's somebody else. There's others and they could harm me. Huh? thus making an erroneous distinction between myself and others. One time a devotee approached Ramana Maharshi and said, how should we behave or treat others? And Ramana thought for a little while and he said, there are no others. Boom, the guy was well, see, he was approaching Ramana because he wanted to find fault with one of the other devotees. And so he was trying to get Ramana to say something that he could use as a weapon. Huh? Like, we should always be kind to others, or we should treat others as we would be, want to be treated ourselves, or, you know, all, any of these moralistic homilies. But Ramana knew his mind, uh, and so he gave a, 
a truth, a truth that is beyond the platform that this questioner was standing on. The questioner was in duality. He was thinking, oh, there is myself and others. But Ramana, coming from Ajatta, the Ajatta platform, where there is no other, there is only self. So this is the end of fear. Once one realizes, actually, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi, I am everything, then what is there to fear? Even if this body is vanquished, which it will be someday, absolutely, so what? If you want, you can get another one. If you don't, then you can simply rest in Brahman and be liberated eternally. The very recitation of her name will dispel fear. Vishnu Sahasranama 935 is also Bhayapaha. Saundarya Lahari 4 says, Your feet are by themselves powerful to protect those in the grip of fear. Shankaracharya says that to one afflicted with samsara, the cycle of birth and death is known as fear. Shankara's interpretation of fear is also confirmed by sage Durvasa in his Sri Shakti Mahimna. He says, Jarangruti Nivaraya, praying for relief from the fear of birth and death. Those who worship her do not have the fear of birth and death. Mere recitation of her name will dispel this fear. Because she is everything. She is the world. She is the self. She is consciousness. She is ignorance. <laughs> she is Maya and she is the absolute. Huh? She is our own consciousness. She is others' consciousness as well. She is birth and she is death. She is time and she is karma. Huh? Is there anything that she is not? So for this reason, when we're in touch with her through her holy name, then we feel that as unviolable protection. Nothing can harm us. Nothing can shake us. Huh? Neither stirred nor shaken. <laughs> Fear is the worst destroyer of spirituality and the inspiration for all kinds of sinful acts. Fear is a product of mind. Not only it obstructs the spiritual path, but also it destroys the progress already made. Fear not only afflicts the mind, though it is a product of the mind, it affects one's health as well. Most fears are imaginary unfounded and a result of our imagination. Fears are mostly related to the physical body. For example, fear of an accident, fear of an unexpected fall, fear of disease or injury, fear of an enemy, etc. Sometimes fear arises out of ego, fear of hurting one's prestige in the society, fall in status, etc. It is important to note that fear arises out of attachment to the physical body and ego, including finance management. There are only two possible remedies for fear. One is to disidentify from the body and mind and realize that one is the self, the witness of all. The other is to completely trust in the Divine Mother to give protection in all circumstances. Remember one thing always. Nobody can harm you, either emotionally or physically, because you are not the body or the mind. You are a divine soul, and abundant divine energies are always around you to protect. This divine energy prevents committing evil acts and protects you from evil influences. After all, what you sow is what you reap. If you are faultless and harmless to others, then no harm will befall you. I remember one time when I was in ISKCON, 
I was at a meeting of some of the big wigs. You know, they, they liked me to take notes because I took very good notes, even though most of it was bullshit. <laughs> and they never actually intended to act on their so-called resolutions. Anyway, one time, one of the big wig managers was saying, do we want him, he was pointing at me, do we want him in the room, you know? <laughs> And another one who knew me well said, don't worry, he's harmless. So actually he was kind of putting me down, huh? but unintentionally gave me a very big compliment. Yeah, I, I don't have a harmful bone in my body. There's nothing that I could imagine doing, you know, to harm another being, even an insect. You know, when I walk up and down the, the walk in front of the house chanting my mantra, I'm always on the lookout for ants or frogs or little worms or whatever, you know, can get lost and wind up out on the sidewalk. So this is the point. If one becomes harmless, then one is not creating karma in the future. By not giving pain, then one becomes released from receiving the pain of karmic retribution. This is the greatest protection of all. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shakti Aum.